Sammy, how you doing? Yo, yo. Welcome to the show. What's good, my brother? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what's happening? <laughs> Nothing much, man. It's an honor to have you here today. Talk about the new album, Such Is Life. So tell me about it, man. Blessings, blessings, man. It's my fifth studio album, man. I was um in a great healing place of creating it. You know what I'm saying? I think uh with the pandemic going on and the race war going on, it's refreshing. And I thought it was pivotal to put out something that could give people peace, um, some light, some love, uh, some passion, some vulnerability. Um, it took about three months to work uh, and, and get through. I actually started working on it before um, the Millennium Tour took part. So it was just, a, it's a, it's a, it's a honest body of work and I'm very, very proud of it. Mm -hmm. Now you were part of the Millennium Tour. Were you able to do any performances? Cause when did that start? Didn't that start early, like late February? Yeah, like February 29th to be exact. Yeah. So we got about, um, out of the, I want to say 32 slated cities, we got about six underneath our belts before COVID-19 hit, you know? And it was a, it was a blessing to um, be back on the big stage with my fans, um, those I love and admire, and really just to reunite with my day ones, you know what I'm saying, as well as my peers. So it was, it was awesome, but you know, of course, um, health as well. So we, we, we quarantined in and making sure we get everything right back in the United States before we can go out there and rock. How many songs have you written during the quarantine? I would say about 14, man. Um, I started working on my sixth studio album called Sunsets. Initially, I want to come out in December, but maybe it'll roll over to the top of uh, 2021. And I think it's cool that in the season of stillness, we were able to, and when I say we, we as a people should have been able to tap into a um, place in a dimension where we're able to do all the things we didn't have the time to do, you know? So um, Sunsets is 14 songs in. I allow my fans to really watch me write the uh, records on IG Live. And um, once I've run in the studio, I allow them um, listen to it three, four times back. In my essence, we're doing this album together. That's the first time I think something like this has ever been done. Has there been any discussions of bringing back the Millennium Tour to do it virtually? Because I know performances are basically off limits now with coronavirus. Um, right now, actually, they just announced some new dates for 2021. Of course, everything is still day to day, month to month. Uh, the world is crazy. I think they're about to shut down Atlanta again. You know what I'm saying? We've been wilding down here and whatnot. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> we back open. So I think right now, um, it's slated, I want to say from April and May of 2021 right now. Just think about that. It's like a year away. That's crazy. Um, I mean, I've already made my pivot for 2020, man. Uh, everything has been directed to such as life, um, expanding my candle line. Uh, what else do I have going on? Good to know it's a book that I've been writing since really 2013. And now that I'm back in a creative space, uh, I want to put that out in the fall. And then sunsets. As far as shows and walkthroughs and, and things of that nature, that's super beyond any artist's control. You know, it's, 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 it's an act of God. And um, I think we all need to take this COVID-19 seriously. I know some people that was affected by it personally. I haven't lost anybody. But it's something that we kind of got to get under wraps as as a nation first before we can go back into the arenas and really rock out freely. How long have you been quarantined yourself for? Uh, I was initially two and a half, three months. You know what I'm saying? Since uh, since we got off tour, and then um, I don't know, man. You know, I I, I pray. I'm a God fair man. I got my mask. I sanitize. It's it's almost inevitable to not think that we can't catch it. You know what I'm saying? And when I say we, everyone. I think everyone has had some type of uh, symptom from COVID-19, but I was in the crib for like two and a half, three months. I know you were probably writing poems. I know you wrote poems and, and I know you, you said that you worked on 14 songs. Anything else that you're working on? Yeah, man, the 14 songs so far with Sunsets. Uh, being, being in, it, it allowed me to show some poetry. It's always been tucked inside of me. I always had that gift but it was my first time like bringing it out to the public. It's something I kind of kept sacred. Um, the book Good to Know, man, is what I'm really excited about because I feel like I understand women as far as uh, how they think, how they feel. I've been singing to the hearts of many since I was a kid. So um, I wanted to give women the insight of a man's mind, not saying I know everything about love because clearly I don't, but uh, I think it's very important for a man to understand a woman and a woman to understand a man so we can find that common ground and that happy medium. So that's something I'm very excited about to mm -hmm. execute and see all the way through. What do you think women don't know about men and men don't know about women? Uh, women don't understand how dumb we are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're very, we're very simple minded. You know, oftentimes when a woman says she's fine or she's okay, or in, in, in some very serious uh, 
time. Um, no, they're not fine. You might need to dig a little more or sometimes do an act of kindness or service to level the playing grounds. And I think what we got to understand with women, they were born to love. They have this gift of intuition. So it's, 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 it's I think, uh, severe and pivotal to give you honesty, your truths, and live in that confidently. Uh, for better or for worse, at least there'll be some respect there. You know what I'm saying? So those are things that I've learned in my dating life, trial and error, making mistakes. I've had some awesome relationships and I've had some terrible encounters. So each one of those things I've learned from, and instead of just incorporating those experiences in my music, I wanted to do it in literature also. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your project, Him. Yeah, I'm him. I'm him. Man, um, that was life changing. It was it was that project that brought me back to the forefront. Uh, one day I remember being um, four mortgages behind, sitting at my dining room table, and I had this idea, and I just let a little sample out on Instagram, and then four million views later, uh, I got managers asking me, "Do I have management? I have labels asking me, am I signed?" And we took a viral video and and made it uh, a worldwide tour. I did a tour with Tank the following year, released my third studio album, Coming of Age. Uh, that catapulted to Everlasting, to my own headlining tour, and then to being brought on to the Millennium Tour 2020. So it's it's crazy how one moment on the internet can really change your life. So that's what I'm him represents for me, like the rebirth, so to speak, of Sammy's career. And it also has that 2000s, early 2000s R&B sound, and you worked pretty hard on the production. What was the process yeah. of like the tracks? For, it was dope, man. Um, shout out to Doughboy, shout out to my brother City and my engineer Demetrius Bell. Uh, I remember in that time, again, I didn't have the resources to go into a studio or to reach out to writers or producers. So I created my own team that I felt could uh, tap into the traditional R&B, but still have the instrumentation of what's going on currently, you know, for the millennials. And I'm a middle child. I'm only 33. But since I've been around so long, I look up to the tanks, uh, Joe. John B., uh, Brian McKnight, Boys to Men, et cetera, um, I was able to tap into that true essence of vulnerability, transparency, honesty, that sexy, and put it on some some 808s and some chords that still resonated with the, the, the millennials of the generation. So it was dope to create a sound and to have a vision and for that vision to be the same sound that brought me back. Mm -hmm. When I listen to I'm Him, it reminds me a lot of Confessions and TP2. Because those oh, were wow. Those were wow. two pinnacle albums of the early 2000s R&B. That, that just humbled me, brother. I grew up on, of course, Usher Raymond. And then um, I know R. Kelly, of course, has his personal issues and things that he's dealing with, right? Um, but I think it's fair to say, musically, we can't ignore his genius. And uh, I remember being 13, listening to TP2.com. Um, and I was 11th grade, actually, 2004, when Confessions came out. So there was two albums that was very, very instrumental in my life. And I think as a creative, we hold some of those songs dormant in our subconscious. So I was able to tap into some things that I respected from that, that time. Mm -hmm. You started out in the 90s. So how do you feel about the sound of R&B right now? <clears throat> Honestly, if you would have asked me this 10 years ago, you know, I would have said it was a dying genre. But, you know, in 2020, R&B is in a great place. Um, is it as mainstream as we would like it to be? No. But uh, there's so many artists. And then with the streaming formats that we have, you just have to dig and search, but there's a lot of great R&B out there. It's a lot of soul, it's a lot of passion, it's a lot of uh, pain, it's a lot of honesty. And and I feel like it's just a matter of time before it goes full circle and R&B becomes the number one genre again, mm -hmm. on radio, so to speak. Would you say it was the number one genre in the 90s or that was hip hop? No, I would say, uh, I think in the 90s, R&B was the number one genre from an urban standpoint. Hip hop has always been the most influential. But in 2020, of course, we know that hip hop is number one genre of music. And I think it's difficult to beat because you have auto-tune. So all rappers can sing with melody now, you know? Yeah. So it puts us singers in a tricky place. Like you can actually, it'll be Young Thug featuring Future and Future will be singing a hook instead of a Chris Brown or a Trey Songz. And that's quite interesting. So that's a fickle place. But you know, um, you can't fight father time. You roll with the punches and you evolve or you evaporate. Do you feel as though auto-tune devalues R&B? Uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a church boy. So there's passion and there's uh, vulnerability and there's this, this, this spirituality factor that's missing from R&B. When you listen to R&B sometimes with auto-tune, I always say this, robots have no feelings. 
So that's a generated sound. That's a technology thing. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you feel lifeless after listening to the radio because people aren't using their natural born gifts anymore. So auto tune does bring a disconnect, in my opinion, to R&B music. What was it like? Being, what was it like being so young and starting out in the game? Mm -hmm. Um, it was fun, man. You know, uh, you don't realize this business till hindsight. You know, it wasn't until I was like 15, 16 that I looked back and I was like, damn, I was kind of like a big deal at the age of 12, 13, 14. Yeah. So it, it wasn't business. It was very pure. It was very innocent. All I knew was um, I could sing and, and to, to give fans my energy and I knew the world loved me. So it, it was dope being a, a boy from the small cities of Florida and seeing uh, Toronto and Hawaii and Dubai and all these places that you only really seen in history books and they didn't even seem obtainable. And just because I had the gift of song, I was blessed to expand my, my mindset, my culture, uh, my vernacular, um, my spirit. It, it was, it was a quite the blessing to have such vision at the young age that I had it at and to be doing what I was doing at that age. It was beautiful. Your debut album reminds me a lot of Immature. Yeah, shout out to Batman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me you a see, lot. Of yeah, you know, it's, that's, that's crazy that you say that. Like, I, I grew up on Immature. Um, I thank God for the time that he brought me into this earth. I have a lot of great music inside of me. I listen to a lot of great music, a lot of amazing artists coming up. And that's very, very instrumental to the longevity that you see with the Sammy brand. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the key to longevity for an artist like you and just for other artists in the game to stay in the game this long? Man, talent gets you in the room, brother, but character keeps you, keeps you there. It's not about just who can sing or who can rap or who can, you know, uh, if it's poetry. People have to really like you, even more so now in a social media world. People have to be interested in what you have to, to give as far as your content and your lifestyle. Um, the same people you pass going up the ladder is the same people you may need to call on when you're climbing down a little bit and start to decline. So I'm very aware that ethics, morals, and codes um, have a lot to do with uh, lasting in this business, not just your talent and your gift. Mm -hmm. I've heard about the stories about your manager and everything. Do you think that's why there's a lot of artists that are independent today because of managers who basically just steal from their artists and don't represent them the right way? Yeah, I'm not the only one with a sad song, you know, in that department, man. Um, sometimes they wire you to be creative and not worry about the business. And then when you do that, you become vulnerable to uh, being taken advantage of from a financial standpoint. And I thank my manager, my ex-manager, for doing that to me, though. You know, all those things made me a better writer, a better artist, uh, a better man. I don't get rattled easily. Um but unfortunately, you know, again, some artists don't bounce back from that. And, and, and I encourage everybody to understand, man, there's enough money to go around for everybody, you know? And, and my team that I'm surrounded around, uh, around now, they're fair, uh, they're passionate about me and they share that same vision. But a lot of artists, again, don't bounce back from such uh, instances that I experienced. But yeah, it, it ultimately made me greater though. You can't be great if you don't go through things that make you great. What's crazy is that you still hear stories about it today, and it didn't just happen to just like small artists. It happened to artists like Billy Joel. We're talking here, TLC. Yeah, yeah. New yeah, yeah. I heard. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's easy to get caught up again in in just trusting somebody. Sometimes it's not a, a matter of ignorance and not knowing any better or not reading your paperwork. Um, my manager now, Skino, that's my big brother. So if he brings me a business opportunity, I automatically in my spirit assume because we're cut from a different cloth, like was solid that is going to be fair business but that same vulnerability and that same trust can also hinder you for years you know what i'm saying so i encourage every artist to be their own boss and their own leader and to protect themselves and to have of course attorneys that has their best interests at heart if you don't understand something ask questions uh and, and, and dumb it down to where it, it, it resonates with your mental and understanding it's just important man to protect yourself and your brand and that's important for artists, everyone who's tuned in right now, take notes because it's important. That yeah. You establish a trust with your manager. Make sure they're not going to be stealing yeah. anything from you. <laughs> yeah, I think me and my manager were like homies, man, and friends like four years before I even asked him to manage me, maybe even longer. So get that foundation solid. Yeah, that's important. That's right off the bat of things. That's really important to do. 
Would you make an R&B album today with the 90s production sounds? Because I know Tory Lanez was saying that he's got an album coming out in the future that sounds like 80s hip hop, which I'm interested to hear. Tory Lanez is, first of all, a beast, so he can tap into whatever he wants yeah. to. Um, I, I, I would definitely do it. Um, that's where I derive from, the, the, the 90s and the late, the, in the early 2000s. That's my time. Um, I still, you know what? You have so much freedom in music, though. You don't even have to cater to the millennials if you so choose to do that. There's an audience that just wants that sound back. Yeah. And, and, and Such Is Life embodies some of those uh, those sentiments as well as Sunset. So that's right up my lane. You know, that's how I was able to sneak back in, so to speak, is because the instrumentation, the cadences, the harmonies is very reminiscent of that time for people. So I love that you can just create that for that audience and not worry about radio, not worry about DJs. Just cater to those who miss the 90s R&B feel. Yeah. Who's your favorite R&B artist from the 90s, if you had to choose one? Man, it's tough. Uh, you know what? Again, uh, I'm going to say this, and again, I have to always do this disclaimer because of his legal allegations. But R. Kelly was the king, you know? The world all agreed, undisputed, the king of R&B was R. He was the only person for me to be able to do, like, um, bedroom music. He would do gospel albums simultaneously and also give you a hook on a Jeezy record or something like in the early 2000s, right? And But he can give you I Believe I Can Fly and the world's greatest. Like, no artist had that freedom to, like, dabble into those different genres so effortlessly. So, again, you can't take from his genius. I don't agree with anything that he's up against as far as the charges. But, again, if you can separate the two, I don't know who did it better. Yeah. 12 plays, undisputably one of the greatest R&B albums of all time. <laughs> of course, of course, man. 12 play was crazy. <laughs> then there's other people that say uh, TP2.com was better. That's my favorite one. TP2, yeah. uh, like, that's my favorite one. You know, it was, uh, it was raw records like I Wish. He was just kind of like, to me, rap singing before rap singing was cool. If you really go back to the album, listen to how he was just flowing melodically. That set the precedent for people to be able to take a rapper's cadence, but sing beautiful melodies over it. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, it was before his time. What people don't realize or may not realize is that he was a producer. So he produced all those tracks himself too. Very much so. Self-contained, man. And he wrote, any vocal arranged himself. He was very one dimensional. You know, and when I say one dimensional, excuse me, self-sufficient. He didn't need anyone in the lab with him. He could create a classic by himself. And that, that and he's writing for like Michael Jackson. I mean, you know what I mean? He, he, he's, he, he was musically a genius. Yeah. Now, getting into the production, who would you say is the best R&B producer from that era? In the 90s? Whew, that's ugly right there. You got uh, Dallas Austin, who was doing an amazing job. Of course, he discovered me and changed my life. Um, mm, the 90s. You got Teddy Babyface, Teddy Riley. Uh, I would have to give it to Babyface, though. You know, Babyface was actually producing and, and – he, he's written every song there is to think of, you know what I mean? But I, it's, it's a close call. Dallas Austin, Teddy Riley, Babyface. Who else was killing it in the 90s? Like, killing it, killing it. There's somebody I'm missing, but he's right on my, the, the edge of my tongue. Um, Brian McKnight, that was the more on the singing side. I would have to give it to Babyface and Teddy. That, I think that's why I enjoyed the verses so much, because it wasn't a win, lose, or draw. It was just classic music that had we not been in the COVID, we wouldn't have gotten that for free. You know, I don't know if we could afford that ticket. Yeah. So I, I would give it to Teddy, man, or, or, or Babyface in that time. And speaking of other versus battles, what did you think of the one between Alicia Keys and John Legend? Oh, that was beautiful. Because to me, they're like the opposite sex of one another. They both are amazing pianists and uh, vocalists. Um, again, me, I appreciate it from a fan standpoint. I don't look at it as a versus. It's a time for we us consumers to listen and, and give each other the flowers while we're still here and it was beautiful you know what i'm saying it's just a a beautiful ride to watch people evolve and i see how far alicia keys came and i see how far that john legend came creating his own thing from not just being underneath like kanye's wing he's his own entity now you know so uh it's just refreshing to be able to see these legends um give us 10 to 20 records that takes us back to a moment in time and i think we need that in this space that we're in in the world I agree. You're also a songwriter. You've written for Tank, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Tank is my big brother, man. Um, I love Tank. Uh, 
he's 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 everything that uh I aspire to be as far as longevity is concerned. He came in the game actually the same year, 1999, and um, I just actually talked to him a couple weeks ago in L.A. We had dinner. Um, I wrote Next Breath for me and mine, but when I finished it, I said out loud, literally, maybe it was manifestation, that the only other person that could sing the song and do it justice is Tank. And when Atlantic heard it and took it, it was my first number one as a songwriter. So that was Devon. And congrats on that. How much do you usually profit off of writing a track for someone else? Oh, I mean, it's it's awesome. Um, that's when I learned the game as far as publishing is concerned. Yeah. Uh, when I was going through things with my ex-manager, I would ghostwrite for certain artists. Of course, I can't say who I was ghostwriting yeah. for, but that was how I was keeping the lights on, you know, giving people melodies and, and lyrics. Um, I thought I would change R&B through that way because for a time, my ex-manager did not want me to resurface as an artist. He just did not want to see me win. So I was like, cool, I'll fall back. I'll ghostwrite and change the content and the narrative that way through my pen. And that's when I started to get residual income. I didn't have to be on a stage or in a club to make money. So it struck a light bulb in my head that I don't need to write records just for myself, but also uh, spread it amongst the industry that I'm in. Mm -hmm. That's insane that your manager was just like, yeah, I don't even want you to thrive and succeed. Bro. It's crazy, man. You know, some people feel entitled to your gift, and that's unfortunate because it was given by God, you know. But I don't cry about it again because it's a plethora of other artists that's gone through it, and they haven't bounced back um, the way that I did. So um, it's, 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 it's part of the Sammy story. And, again, I appreciate him for his wicked ways and vile intent back in that time. And I pray that he's doing well. And um, all those things that I went through, it, it, it made me the artist and the man that I am today. You mentioned stages and performances. What's your favorite stage that you performed on? Man, there's so many. Um, Madison Square Garden is always classic. I think just like it is for the athletes, it's the same for us artists. There's no better feel. And I think New York has a cheat. I got discovered there, you know? I did the Apollo in 1998, 1999. So um, to make myself a household name around the world and to play anywhere in New York, um, is always surreal for me because I remember being like 10, 11 years old, desiring to to be a star in this in this business. So um, LA is always a vibe. Um, Atlanta, I roam these streets every day, so it's nothing like the hometown love. Um, because so many artists are here, when I sell out anything in Atlanta, it's always refreshing. Because again, this is where I became a man at. Although I'm from Florida, I've been here 15 years, and this is where I became a star at. So I would say. Madison, anywhere in LA, and anytime I play in Atlanta, those are my top three markets. What was your Apollo experience like? This is a stage where many greats, such as Lauren Hill, was booed off of. Yeah, yeah, Lauren Hill, the great, was booed. So imagine a 12 year old, 11 year old kid from Miami at that time. I was nervous, man. I, I remember taking a, a deep breath wearing this suit that was baggy, like the Steve Harvey suits at that time. Um, Steve Harvey was actually the host. And I rubbed the log and I took a deep breath. And my mother said something before I went out. She said, if I could win the New York crowd over, I could take over the world. That was really what settled me in my nerves. You know, it was like, all right, go do it. And there's this old lady that used to be, or this elderly lady that used to be in the front row at all the Apollo shows. Mm -hmm. While I was singing, she was like, sing, boy, like, like, like a church lady. <laughs> and I started in the church and that's all I needed to boost my confidence and to boost my self-esteem. So, um... It was beautiful, man, to, to, to be so nervous, but also so confident simultaneously. And that be the platform that created the Sammy brand, you know, at a young age. It was, it was remarkable, but nerve wracking at the same time. Yeah, I could tell. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Hill, that's tough. If she gets booed, anyone could get booed on that. Yeah, it's fair game for anybody, <laughs> precisely. No one's safe. So yeah. I want to get into your collaboration with Soldier Boy, as you know. What was that like working with him for that class? Shout, shout out, shout out to Big Draco, my homie. Um, he, uh, I, it's funny how life works. I was just in the right place at the right time. I went to this video shoot that DJ Khaled and I want to say uh, Ace Hood was shooting in Atlanta, and they had a lot of cameos. And Soldier was there, and he came up to me and was like, "Bro, uh, I got this idea. Um, I laid it down, but I hate how I sound. This is before Auto Tune like was a thing for real, for real." except for T-Pain, of course. So I was like, all right, I'll come by the studio and listen to it. And it took a couple of weeks for our schedules to align, but I made it to the studio and I heard it and I thought it was catchy, but I didn't realize how big it was. So I did it, left the studio, not thinking anything of it. And 
he was the key of um, the king of the internet before the internet became what it is today. So they leaked the record, and I think in a few hours, it had like four or 500,000 hits on YouTube. And that's when he said that, you know, that's the new single. And it changed my life. It changed his life. And I was happy to be on, I think, the way top three on the top 100 on Billboard. You know what I'm saying? It was a pop smash for me again. It got me overseas and um, put me back on Jimmy Kimmel's and the Jake Leno's and the things of that nature. So it was a blessing to be a part of that record. Yeah, it was big time. It's still big time. When we look back on it, it's one of the greatest mm -hmm. 2000s. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I think everyone's kissing everybody through the phone now during COVID. So we were <laughs> on to something. You got it now. <laughs> yeah, we were on to something. I think you guys were. I heard about the, the police, police brutality incidents that you've been through and just everything going on right now. I mean, will it get better? Do you see it ever getting better? I see change. I see change. I, um, we've been fighting as far as we Blacks for 400 years, unfortunately, right? But we do have technology where we're able to document and 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 some people, sometimes that still does us no justice, but I seen something two days ago where a cop or some cops were like detaining a man and the civilians, of course, recorded it and actually helped that guy get detained like without getting killed, you know? And the cop actually said, please come help me, you know, just help me get his arm to the back. I'm not putting my neck, my, excuse me, my knee on his neck, it's on his back. They, that, that George Floyd, you know, unfortunate mishap, that, that slaughter, um, and watching a grown man cry out for his mother, who's also deceased, it shook up the world. And, and I think that we're tired of it. Um, I'm all for burning shit up, you know, born burning shit down to build ourselves up. Like, don't ask why we're looting. Don't ask why we're protesting. Ask these cops why they're so in fear of black queens and kings of this nation. And we have a long way to go, but I feel like step by step, day to day, uh, we're going to be in a better place. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's ever going to be what Martin Luther King truly envisioned because there's a lot of hate, you know, and that's a learned behavior from a child. I think racism is taught. It's you're not born a racist, you know, yeah. but we are fed up. And I think this generation is the generation to really, really provoke the change we've been deserving of for quite some time, really all of our lives. I agree with your point on racism that it's put in your head at a young age, it's fit from your parents, I would say, because I was taught to yeah. respect everyone, no matter what their background is. Then you look at some yeah. other people, you look at their background and their families, and then you see the, the, re, the, the way they are because of their families. Yeah, 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 it's unfortunate, man, but you know, I'm all about peace, light, and love, so that's what I try to exude on a daily basis, even when I'm not feeling light, or even when I'm heavy, even when I'm upset. Um, God is in everything, and uh, I thank my parents for instilling morals and ethics and uh, that, 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 that way of thinking into me. So, you know, I think if we all desire change, we need to be the change that we want to see one by one, you know, and hold yourself accountable every day and look at yourself in the mirror and see how you can become a better human being. What's unbelievable is that these officers draw out on bond. I mean, we couldn't keep them in? Um, man, it, it, it's, it, you know, again, I've been racially profiled twice. So I, I don't, when it comes down to this subject matter, it's so vulnerable because I don't have the answers. You know, I don't know the solution. Um, I just know we should love. I just know we should have compassion. I just know we should all be empaths. Uh, and that goes for police officers, you know, but then there's some police officers that signed up for that job strictly to do the corrupt things that they're doing, you know? And they've been getting away with it for so long and they protect each other. It's like they're a gang, you know what I'm saying? They are the most dangerous gang roaming the earth. It's not Bloods and Crips. It's not GDs. It's police officers. So I pray that from the inside out, systematically, they, they start to clean out the, the, the bad apples, you know, but I don't, I don't know like how to contain that. I don't know how, where do we start, but um, it starts with them. It's not us. We're not the problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's with the system too, but that's how yeah. I feel as though when they go for training, they teach you a certain way. They're all covering up for each other. Yeah, very much so. Again, that's why I said, like, from the inside out, systematically, they need to kind of reassess how, how they do things and go about things and teach things. This has been going on since the beginning of time, and just seeing the reaction from all races this time, it just boggles my mind because we, we saw the tapes with Rodney King back in the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's it's, it's, it's a, a redundant situation. And, again, that's why the world is in an uproar. We're just tired. We're tired of being tired. 
we're, we're not saying that black lives are better. We're just saying we matter. You know what I'm saying? And, and we, we're, we're fighting for equality. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. So if you're not rocking with us, then you're against us in that life. And that's just how I feel. Yeah. I, I just don't get it, man. Like the racist white people, when, when ever someone says black lives matter, they take it a certain way. It's like they think their lives don't matter. I, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I really just don't get it. But is there anything that you're doing for, you know, police brutality to raise awareness about besides Palm? I know you wrote a song back then. Yeah. I, um, I, I mean, I did a song called Dear America. We have a song coming on a compilation album through uh, my label Empire called Shackles. I want to shoot a visual for it. Um, I think more than anything, just being vocal, you know, using my platform to bring awareness. Forget just the poems. That's just a moment at that time. But I look like what the police are killing. You know, I got wild hair and a beard and 30 plus tattoos. So um, being vocal about my experience and someone said that there's a lot of black George Floyds that's alive. I'm one of them. I've, I've had a gun to my head. I've been had my car impounded and uh, I've been accused of being on PCP. I don't do drugs. I'm like, I didn't know what that is, sir. But because they just felt like harassing me, this is what was going on and I was helpless. So I think the best thing we could do is be vocal. Uh, use our social handles to, 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 to get justice for all those who no longer are here to speak for themselves. Um, God gave us a platform, bro. And that's why we're so powerful in numbers, the strength in numbers. So come together and, and actually uh, in unity and in union, because the, the, the United States is very divided. But we as a people, man, every day, one person at a time, hold hands, man, and, and understand there's only one race, and that's the human race. And that's what you're starting to see starting to see whites and Hispanics and Asians and Blacks, of course, really rally out here. And I'm all a part of the movement. I, I, I'm very, very vocal about it. And I'm down for the cause, you know? Yeah, I'm hoping things get better. And I just can't believe that even during a pandemic, police officers are still behaving like animals. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah it's ugly. It, it really is. I want to get into a quick sports talk, though. You're from Miami. Are you a Dolphins fan? Nah, man, they broke my heart too many times as a kid. I'm a, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan. Yeah. How do you feel yeah. about Tom Brady? Oh, I'm you're... excited. I'm excited. You know, we haven't seen the playoffs since we won the Super Bowl back in like '02, so I've been struggling. You know what I'm saying? But now I get to talk my shit a little bit in the barbershop this year with with Gronk and and Brady. My manager is actually from Boston, so he's trying to like merge over here now. And I'm like, nah, you got to stay with the Patriots. Yeah, yeah, uh, but they did, they, they did just pick up Cam, but I'm, I'm excited, man, to, to watch football this year. I'm a definitely a diehard Buccaneer. I've been there since, like, Warren Sapp, Senior Rice, John Lynch, uh, Mike Allstott, Ward Dunn, that era, you know? So I, I, I love my dad. I spent my summers with my pops in Tampa. And um, it's, 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 it's dope to see that we finally, I feel like, have the tools at least to get to the playoffs. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing that connection with Gronk. Yeah, him, Brock, and, and Mike Evans, that's scary. You know what I'm saying? That can be a problem on offense. How did you feel about Jameis Winston? Did not like him. Like and I'm a Seminole fan. No, no, no. I'm a Seminole fan. I'm a Seminole fan. So I, I knew he was a, a gunslinger. He, he can throw it. He's a winner, but he's not a winner. He's too reckless. You know what I mean? You can't throw 33 touchdowns and 30 interceptions. You know what yeah. I mean? That the, the ratio is just not in our favor. You put our defense in a, in a, in a bind every time. So. Uh, he's he, he he's I play Madden too, and he used to he he plays just like that on that. I don't know how I press X and it goes to O. You know what I'm saying? But it's realistic. You know, you hit or miss with Winston. He had his run though. I mean, shout out to Winston, but I definitely wasn't a fan of him as a as a quarterback for the Bucks. You've been a Buccaneer fan forever since you were a young kid. How do you feel about the uniform change? Because back in the day, they used to have those creamsicle jerseys. Yeah, I did not like the orange. We we looked like clowns and we played like clowns back in those times. <laughs> I hate those throwback orange jerseys, but the black and the red, you know what I'm saying? That that's that's more uh swagged out to me. So I like the new I like the new joint. I'm curious to hear your basketball team, Magic, Miami Heat. Absolutely not. So I'm I'm Florida State and I'm Tampa Bay in football, but basketball, man, uh rest in peace to my superhero Kobe Bryant. Uh, 1996. Um, I've been there since because of that, that guy. Uh, I took the death pretty bad. I have a tattoo behind my ear, 24-8. And it's really to remind myself that, 
you know, there's 24 hours a day uh, in a day and there's seven days a week, but he lived his life 24, eight. He went over and beyond, you know, mama mentality was really a thing. It wasn't like a, a, a facade. He really was the first person in the gym and the last person to leave. And that's why he achieved everything that he achieved in basketball. So I'm a diehard Lakers fan. How did the mama mentality make you better, <clears throat> not only as a person, but a singer songwriter? Yeah, I have no excuse to not be great. Well, if you if you study the greats, then then you have to pick up their habits and their work ethic. And Kobe led the way without speaking much. He just simply exuded greatness and discipline. And um, I genuinely, genuinely, this is the first time we've lost a public figure that I can't grasp my mind around it. It doesn't feel real. Uh, Kobe was my Michael Jordan, you know. So um, I have no excuse to not be in the gym, not to be in the studio, not to be punctual not to be my best self in interviews you know it's no excuses just just dig deep within yourself and, and pull your greatness out and that's something that Kobe did day in day out on and off the court 2020 has been a year from hell and it's something we'll never forget very much so man we're going to be in history books in a few it's crazy <laughs> I'm living during history and I imagine 30 years from now telling our kids this <laughs> yeah we, we survived the pandemic and and a racial war simultaneously yeah, and hopefully, you know, Trump will be gone in November. <laughs> Let us pray, brother. Let us pray. <laughs> we got <laughs> Sammy, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Anything else you want to let the audience know? No, my brother. I just want to say thank you, man, for the platform. I'm sorry I couldn't get to you yesterday. I was a lot of the weather. Um, but thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you for your platform. Thank you for your support. And to all my fans out there, man, I just appreciate the love. Uh, my fifth album, Such As Life, is out now. Um, we just released the Peace Visual. It debuted on BT Gems and BT Soul. And I'm just grateful for uh, being able to do what I love to do, man, and, and make a decent living doing it. And from a child star to a teenager and now a grown man, it's truly a blessing and I'm humble. That's right. Like you said, your new album, Such As Life, is available on all platforms. Make sure you go check it out and download it most of all. I still download yeah. my music. I don't share yeah, yeah. <laughs> my man thank you thank you no doubt sammy take care and stay safe all right god bless you king thank you god bless you